Well, today we're on a wonderful adventure. You know, <clears throat> as a young biologist, these were my favorite movies. Tarzan of the Apes, Johnny Weissmuller. And as a young biologist, I was fascinated because I started to realize the jungle noises that they were using were from Australia with, with the kookaburra. But you know, I heard this from Johnny Weissmuller. You recognize that? And as a young kid, that was my trademark. <laughs> not, not to the great beloved joy of my parents, but uh, I used to practice that a lot. <laughs> so sometimes I think, I was actually born 20,000 years too late. Because these places we visit, in those days of the Pleistocene, these huge animals roamed throughout the world. And actually, it's so interesting that they still exist here in Africa. You know, the biggest lions ever recorded through the fossil evidence were the North American lions. Of course, we don't know about North American lions, but here we can still see and visit the lions. But then, of course, I, as I learned more about uh, the Pleistocene and uh, the people who lived there at the time, I realized I was born at just the right time. Uh, we are so privileged, I believe, as cruisers to be able to see the world and to see the wildlife and visit these places so exotic to so many people. And uh, Jen and I have had the wonderful experience of being up close and personal with so many animals. So I, I always kind of ponder philosophically, uh, as travelers, we really have some unusual opportunities. And I think we can inspire others with our travels, particularly through our photography. And so that's what I hope to do and it, I'd love to do. Can we make a difference with our stories when we go home and with our photographs? And this sort of a quote really rings true for me. The, the notion that once the, the mind is stretched to a new dimension, it cannot go back to where it was before. A uh, wonderful quote. Well, you know, after having been to Africa, I think you probably realize how true this quote is. Nothing here is predictable in Africa, is it? <laughs> and wildlife is never too far away. <laughs> These are real experiences. Come for the wildlife, stay for the exercise. Well, you know, I'm a photographer by hobby, and I've done it really throughout my life, uh, working with national parks all the way through. and. Uh, I love taking wildlife photographs. And Africa, you just cannot beat Africa. But, uh, you know, I'm not a really great photographer. I just love doing it. And now and then, I really have an opportunity. For example, this albatross was uh, on our last cruise in Chile, and I had an opportunity to film just this most amazing sequence where he was becoming airborne. And if you ever have seen an albatross trying to take off from the water, it's like, I can't count the number of steps that he had to take as he was running along. They run along for quite a while. You know, these albatross, the black browed albatross, are roughly an eight to 10 foot wingspan. They are big birds. So now and then I'm fortunate, I have sequences like that, but I really can't compete with David Attenborough and BBC. His team is just, every time he comes up with something new, I just, my jaw drops. And he has uh, professional photographers getting this kind of 
incredible photography. So I just, I can't compete with people. <laughs> and they know all the tricks of the trade. Well, you know, I came across something just by accident. I started doing 360-degree photographs with my, cam with my uh, telephone, with my Android phone. And uh, here's an example. This is uh, Kesiarani Monastery in the hills, the foothills above Athens. Just a beautiful, beautiful monastery. But I'm going to show you, this is one photograph that I've taken with a 360-degree camera on my Android phone. So you'll see, this is one photograph, and it's like you're inside a bubble looking all around. And it's just quite amazing. Well, the neat thing is that I can post 360-degree photographs up on Google Maps, if anyone's familiar with using Google Maps. Usually when I'm preparing for a trip, I'll look up the photographs for that area, and my 360-degree photographs are, I guess, unique, and they're sort of profiled. And so I have this really amazing, I have, like, here's uh, the Parliament buildings in Cape Town that I took a year ago, over four million view views of that one photograph. Uh, another one in Auckland that I took, four million views. Uh, this is over one million views in Taiwan. Uh, what's my next? Cook Islands, over a million views. Uh, Rwanda, Malaga, Spain, over a million views. I can't believe it. People are bored or, I don't know. <laughs> they keep looking at my photographs. So now I'm at, I was hoping I would have reached 50 million, but I'm only at 49. And I get roughly two million views a month. You know, I, was, I wish I just got a penny of you or something, but there's no remuneration. It's just sort of, I'd love to talk about it. If you go to my jollytoad.com, that's my uh, blog, and uh, I have a link to all of these 360 photographs. So who would, who would imagine that those are so popular? Well, today I want to tell you a little bit about the various safaris that Jan and I have gone on. Uh, last year we went on the uh, Okavango, uh, huge, beautiful uh, delta that I've spoken to you a little bit. Uh, we also have gone to a private game reserve, one of these ones that are adjacent to Kruger, unfenced, and then uh, Kruger National Park itself on a little self-drive safari. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not bringing anything new to the table. You folks have done all of this stuff, have been there and done that, but I thought I would just show you some of the experiences that we've had. So Botswana, there's the Okavango, and even in a satellite photograph, it's so obvious, it's uh, just wonderful. This idea that there's a delta in the middle of the desert is very is quite unique so here's the map and uh, there is the Okavango River coming uh, th all the way through the Caprivi Strip and down from Angola from the Angola Heights and of course I won't get into the politics of it but uh, in Botswana you know they're wondering what's going to happen with the Okavango as uh, there's more and more development in Angola. But uh, this is the remarkable Okavango Delta. It uh, floods seasonally into the Kalahari. There's permanent water there, of course, but uh, it expands drastically during the flood season from roughly 4,000 to 12,000 kilometers. So it roughly triples in size. Uh, this flood period begins in March and it uh, spurs these in incredible mi wildlife migrations. So the villagers uh, take you out into the delta in the swamp on these canoes that are called the Makoro. 
and uh, they're pulled. The water is shallow, and this is how they get around. So this is going on our safari, and uh, that young man in uh, his Makaro is taking all the equipment. Uh, there were like three canoes on our safari taking all the gear to take us up into this island where we were really the only ones, and they put us in a tent and uh, told us to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's beautiful, beautiful scenery of uh, the Okavango. And uh, I have to tell you a little personal story that uh, my wife and I were married over 40 years ago. And for our honeymoon, we went to Hawaii. And uh, big island of Hawaii. But then we flew to Kauai, which has a notable swamp, Akamai Swamp. And... Uh, this was my big treat that I was going to show Jan, the swamp. She was not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so what better than for our 40th anniversary to take her to the biggest swamp in the world? <laughs> uh, she, she liked this one a little bit better. So I'm going to show you, uh, this is a little video clip of uh, our experience in uh, the Okavango. Uh, we were very fortunate. We had some really nice weather. But uh, as you see, this was our first day setting out. And as we progressed, the clouds started getting darker and darker. And on the horizon, we started to see huge, huge thunder showers coming down. Well, this is what the Makoro polars are really frightened about. So. Here you can see the weather's changing quite drastically. And all of a sudden, our guide, Scar, took, started pulling very quickly on shore, and he whipped us as soon as we got on shore. He jumped out of the canoe, got his, actually got his personal tent out so we could crawl inside. And you'll see this... Uh, amazing sequence where we're putting up this tent you know this was one of those monsoon rains where you could not no matter what you did you weren't going to stay dry but we stayed pretty dry in his tent there he is he's uh, all the moisture all there was a couple of inches just in the makora from that one downpour and then uh, going upstream he kept saying now this is the most amazing thing to me when he's talking about the hippos. The villagers have been killed by the hippos than more than by any other creature. And when we pulled ashore, we were told there's uh, lions roaming freely. like. There's no fences anywhere. You're in your tent. And you're... So in the morning, we would go for walks, and I would say, I'm a little bit nervous. Where are the lions? And he was never worried about the lions. He kept saying, well, don't worry. I know where they are, because I heard them last night. They were roaring, and they're about two kilometers over there. <laughs> oh, beautiful, beautiful photography for birds. Here we are watching the uh, giraffes and I just had to trust his skill but you know his name was Scar <laughs> and he had one eye and he didn't carry anything except a bottle of water we'd be hiking for hours through lion country there's Scar on the right the most amazing, wonderful human being knew everything about that area, and I trusted him. What choice did I have? <laughs> so here's what he was a little bit worried about. You probably don't recognize it. But it's a big big creature. 
So the hippos literally are walking along the bottom of the river and only popping up occasionally. So you can look at this. There's no hippo in sight. Well, he said, if the hippo comes up on, underneath the Makoro and we capsize and you're in the river, don't swim. Okay. <laughs> well, he said, make sure you don't swim on the surface because you'll create splashes and the hippo will know where you are. What you do is you swim underwater to the bank and then you crawl out. And I said, yeah, I'll have a heart attack and I'll sink to the bottom where the hippo is. <laughs> uh, because you can see, um, they don't use these teeth really for anything other than defense. Um, so, but they have those huge incisors that really are creating a problem for the villagers. Now I have a little experiment here. I've never tried this with a live audience before. But here's one of my 360s that I, I took as a video of this uh, same Makoro trip. And I'm just going to see how this works. So this is a 360 on the Makoro with SCAR. Okay, can I do this? Okay, it works. There's SCAR pulling us along. And the, it's amazing to me, this technology, that I can rotate this 360, there's Jan, as it's playing. So I have a bunch of these 360 clips that I, I just find this technology amazing. It worked, wow. Now to get back to my real program. Okay. So Scar had wonderful stories and uh, was just a bounty of knowledge. And if you have a chance to ever go to the Okavango on the Makoro, just an amazing experience. Uh, this is our, our cook. His name was, I don't know if these are their real names, like Scar, and uh, this fellow, he called himself Baker, but he was, <laughs> he has, uh, for his uh, work table, he's turned the Makoro upside down. So that shows you how the flat bottom they are. And that's our campsite. And he prepared the most incredible meals on an open fire. Like he would actually bake bread. And these were, he didn't have anything really, just a grate and these old cast iron pots, but he would be beautiful stews every night and cooking bread in the morning. And I was just amazed what he could accomplish on an open flame. And this is the countryside we would walk through with Scar, uh, somewhere the lions were over there. <laughs> um, so I took some more 360s. But this is what he was nervous about. At one point, after two hours or three hours of walking, there was a great big mound of fresh dung. And he looked at this, and it's the first time I saw him kind of look around nervously. Because he said, oh, that's a lone male buffalo. And those ones you have to watch out for. It could be just over here in the trees, and we wouldn't see it. And he said the other disconcerting thing about the male, these lone buffalo, is that they'll act as if they don't see you. So if they're feeding or in the water, in the mud hole, they just ignore you. They actually hope that you come closer and closer. Because as soon as you get close enough, they run over and trample you to death. That's their version of welcome. And here we are, our last day. We're leaving, and here comes some more new people on the safari into the Okavango. A uh, second part of it was to go on land to, uh, it's called the Morami Game Reserve. That's the northern part of the Okavango. 
Here it's a very different kind of landscape. We did this by uh, four-wheel drive, driving around uh, through the buffalo grass. Uh, this area is very rich in game. Uh, interestingly enough, they told us that this was a four-wheel drive, but only two wheels worked. <laughs> this is our tent, uh, quite rustic. That was the potty, and uh, that was our entire camp. That's what it looked like. Uh, but, you know, I have to tell you the story the baker told us. He said, one day they were in, in a camp like ours, and this woman came running naked towards him. And he thought, well, I wonder what this is all about. Uh, and then... He looks around and there's an elephant. And she's screaming, an elephant, elephant, I was in the shower. And this is the outdoor shower. And uh, they put around a tarp so that you're in a, you have a private space. But she said she was taking the shower and all of a sudden the water stopped. And she looked up and there was an elephant's trunk. <laughs> and, and the elephant had sucked all the water out of her shower bag. <laughs> so her response was to run out naked, screaming. <laughs> well, now this is in contrast. This is a private game reserve adjacent to Kruger National Park. Balule, uh, we were at this place called Naledi. And you can see the contrast between our tent and uh, the private game reserve. Of course, huge dollars involved in doing these private game reserves, but you do have an opportunity to go on the most amazing game drives and go swimming and uh, listen to the hippos in the river at night and uh, just an amazing experience again. So this is uh, showing you where this is, uh, just right beside Kruger National Park. Uh, the nice thing is that there's no fence so all the big animals, the big five, are roaming freely between Kruger and this private game reserve. And the fence is there, but uh, the fence is there around us. <laughs> That's what I like about these places. Uh, there is an electric fence, so uh, you won't have, for example, the last place we were just before the cruise, they say stay in your hut, uh, your chalet, because there's hyenas. There was no fence. Uh, hyenas really sound interesting when they're just outside your window. <laughs> uh, so these are the kind of game, res uh, game drives we would go on. Uh, sometimes just the two of us and then the tracker sitting in that chair. I don't know about that. You know, when they parked close, we would be coming up so close to elephants, like they would be within, uh, oh, you know, half the distance of this stage here, or uh, Buffalo. And that tracker is sitting there in that seat, and he's only maybe three feet above the ground. Uh, but then when we came close to lions, that's when I was started to get a little nervous. How many of you have had that experience? You're sitting in the open four-wheel drive, and there's a lion and it's just around over the edge, and you're thinking, how come the lions don't put two and two together here? <laughs> in fact, you know, you've probably had this experience where you're on the safari in this vehicle, and someone with a huge lens is saying, hey, the lion's too close, I can't, I can't get it focused. <laughs> Uh, so, to me, this private game reserve was our most incredible opportunity to get photographs of lions. Uh, much, much better than any of the other places that we have been. Because in the private game reserve, they're not restricted to where they drive. They drive everywhere. And they, they know where the prides of lions are. Uh, in the morning, first thing in the morning, they would take us to see the pride of lion. Um, beautiful, beautiful animals. 
and uh, kind of photograph I love to take from a vehicle. <laughs> Lions are just the most amazing cats. For those of you who have cats at home, your cats at home are not social creatures. These guys really truly are social cats. They love to hang out in groups, and of course they are, interestingly, their hunting effectiveness is much higher as a group. And someone who has done the actual research, individual lions succeed roughly 17% of the time. If you hunt as a group, as a team, the group hunts are successful 30% of the time. So you can see it's, it's uh, um, natural selection working once again as these creatures have evolved to take advantage of the hunting opportunities. The males, of course, like to act like the big boss, but uh, we really know who is running the show. The females do the majority of the hunting. And there's a lot of misnomers about being the king of the jungle. I used to think as a kid, you know, if I was going to be the king of the jungle, I'd want to be that big male lion. But then I realized, look at this fellow. He's probably peed in the wrong spot. <laughs> and he's getting an earful. <laughs> and they are not the kings of the jungle. Look at how the elephants treat them. It's like, out of my way, buddy. Elephants naturally don't like lions very much because those lions really are looking for the young elephants. Any chance they get, they'll get those elef the lions out of the way. Now this is a very interesting st fashion style, but you know what those things are? African porcupine quills. It just shows you the size of those things. So here's another example of no respect. Here's a African porcupine and the way he deals with these young lions. They've obviously had some experience with porcupines in the past. Because once you get some quills, you're not going to forget it. And all that porcupine has to do is make a little bit of a maneuver. <laughs> now look at this last one. He's still a little curious, but then as he walks away, the porcupine just does a little shake. <laughs> so just an interesting fact, the African and the North American porcupines aren't related at all. It's another one of these examples of convergent evolution. They've developed these quills entirely independently. Well, you know, male lions, they are living uh, a difficult life. Here's a sequence from uh, this place where we stayed. This is Naledi, that uh, private game reserve. Uh, this is not my video, by the way. But you can see these males are fighting for the females, and they'll fight to the death. So this is the true life of a lion king. Eat, mate, and fight. That's basically, oh, sleep. I forgot sleep. Sleep's an important one. But they only last as king for roughly two to three years. King of the pride. So they are the ones who are mating with the females, but the young tough males are always constantly testing the king of the pride. And they'll actually take over. So the male, the big male, will lose the fight. He has to move out and literally become sort of an independent male who does not do very well, of course, because he's no longer part of the pack, and the females are the great hunters. So they start eating rodents and stuff like that, and just uh, 
lose a lot of that charisma of being king. And uh, the females, of course, stay in the same pack, but the new males will come in, and quite often you'll see two brothers or two nomadic males come in, force out the king of the pride, take over, and the nasty part of the story is that um, they take care of all the young cubs that are in the pride when they take over. It's called infanticide. They will actually kill all the cubs that are there when they take over. So the life of the cub is not all that easy either. Only uh, one in six or eight cubs survive. So this really does not make sense to us, but genetically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, what it means is that the lioness is capable of breeding sooner, and that male only has one goal in life, and that is really to spread his genes, to get the females pregnant as soon and as quickly as possible, and uh, that's increasing his reproduction potential by killing those young. But what that means is, particularly in the old days, uh, when trophy hunting was much, much bigger than it is now, it still is a big thing, though, to the economy. But if you take out a big male like that out of the pride, what that means is that the cubs are dying as soon as a new male comes, takes over the pride. So those are repercussions that we haven't really thought about too much in the past. And... The absence of top predators, if you've come to one of my lectures about this notion of trophic cascades, uh, means a lot to the ecosystem. Once you lose those big predators, things change drastically. And the number of lions has dropped. Look at this, the numbers. 350,000 to roughly 30,000 in the last 15 years. It's just such a dramatic drop. Um, so that's the bad news. The good news, I want to tell you about this young lad, Richard. He invented something you may have run across that you... Here's a TED Talk, and he loves lions, basically. Even though his job as a young boy was to look after the goats and protect them from the lions. So lions were sort of the bane of his existence. So listen to him in his TED talk. I was walking around the car shed with a torch and I'll turn that up the day volume. the lions didn't come. And I discovered that lions were afraid of a moving light. So I had an idea. Since I was a small boy, I used to walk in my room for the whole day. And I even took apart my mom's new radio. And that day, she almost killed me, but... <laughs> but I learned a lot about electronics. <laughs> so, I got an old car battery, an indicator box, the small device found in the motorcycle, and it helps motorists when they want to turn right or left, it blinks. And I got a switch, where I can switch on the lights on and off. And that's a small touch from a broken flashlight. So I set up everything. As you can see, the solar panel charges the battery, and the battery supplies the power to the small indicator box. I call it a transformer. And the indicator box makes the lights to flash. And as you can see, the bulbs face outside, because that's where the lines come from. And that's how it looks to lions when they come at night. The lights flash and trick lions that I was walking around the cow shed, but I was sleeping in my bed. So he invented these lion lights, he calls them, and really they're just uh, tiny little flashlight lights that are twinkling around the perimeter where the goats are. And the lions, ever since he's come up with this, have never bothered his goats. So as he's saying, he's sleeping in bed and he just flips the switch. <laughs> so these lion lights, amazingly, 
have taken off throughout Africa. It's just such a wonderful invention, and not only for the kids, but for the lions, because now the villagers aren't, aren't out poisoning and shooting the lions because they're not coming in and interfering with their livestock. And here's this young man now. He's actually started up a company and he's selling lion lights around the world. Uh, he had, as a result of this invention, he uh, achieved a scholarship and was sent to some of the best schools in Africa. Brilliant, brilliant idea. So that's the end of the story in terms of lions. I, uh, I find it hopeful that uh, there are some things, such as this young man, changing the picture in terms of their life in the, the wild. Uh, I'll just quickly talk about Kruger. Kruger is, in our experience, uh, just the most amazing uh, value. You can stay in your own little hut for, you know, roughly 100 to 150 dollars a night. You drive your own vehicle, you rent a car, you can see amazing wildlife. This is uh, just right there. The first time we drove into Kruger within a kilometer, we were watching elephants, and I realized pretty soon that the elephants were actually a little bit too close. <laughs> Because you can see from our car window, they were only a hundred feet or so. And then when the big matriarch crossed in front of the car, uh, it was big. And you know, when the, I talk about... <laughs> I don't think we really have an appreciation for how big these creatures are. And when they start using you for a belly rub, <laughs> It's really hard on the vehicle. But you know, we would see everything. Giraffe, uh, you name it, all the big five. Although we did not see a leopard. We got to see hyenas. They're here they are feeding on a lion kill of a giraffe. Uh, this is uh, Skakuza, which is the biggest rest camp in Kruger. And uh, the neat thing about this place is that it has trails along the river, but you're on the inside of the electric fence. So you can actually go for nice walks. Here's a, these are the uh, huts. This is the one that we stayed in. The downside is you can see that's the kitchen. And it's an outdoor kitchen. And the monkeys are very clever because they'll sit in the tree and as soon as you've left anything out on the table and deke inside, you know, to grab another sauce or whatever you need, you come outside and everything's gone because the monkeys are up in the tree. Uh, but it's, it is self-contained. It's a lovely little spot. And the Kruger National Park, I think, is the best place for us to go and see elephants. Uh, these remarkable young, young elephants just born literally probably a month or two. And uh, how amazingly the adults can stomp around these tiny little creatures without ever stepping on them. And the, the little guy's just uh, making himself at home. You know, it takes these young, young elephants a few months to learn how to work the trunk because the trunk has so many muscles and it's such a complicated organ that they have to use, that they have to learn how to use that. Elephants are very complex creatures. And we're starting to realize that they can communicate at a much different level than what we had perceived. Maybe even abstract concepts. And this is a photograph I took. And you can see what he's doing with his forefoot there. He was literally standing there with his foot on the ground, and we know that when they're doing that, they're communicating. They're sending infrasonic sound through the ground, and they can literally cover 10 kilometers with this infrasonic. So the other elephants, there's another photograph, can sense these sounds in the ground with their foot and they're communicating through the ground. 
up to 100 square kilometers. So sometimes they've observed suddenly elephants will start moving and long before any predator is in sight because they've been warned by other elephants. This one here shows you our level of uh, human hearing. The red line shows a lower limit. These infrasonic sounds are a much lower level. Here's a big, big male that was really ticked off one day when we were actually luckily not in our vehicle, but we were on the safari truck, which are these big, big vehicles. And our guide, our driver said, don't worry, the elephant knows that we're bigger than it. And it's not going to try to mess with us. You have to trust these guides a lot when they tell you these things. You can see that this elephant was upset. He's shaking his head, his ears are flared out. He's trumpeting. And um, I'm kind of glad we weren't in that vehicle right beside it. But here's the most interesting thing. As we're driving along, we come up beside this vehicle, and these people are park uh, contractors who are hired to work in the crew camps. And you can see all the mattresses are out in the rain and everything. But then look at this. They all start jumping out, and the lady has carried a huge firearm to protect them from the elephant. Well, our guide has words with them saying, stay in your vehicle and get that rifle out of here. Um, so wildlife viewing, when we make these kinds of expeditions to Africa, I like to think that we're making a difference. And we are actually making a big contribution to the economy. A lot of these places we visit, we are probably the biggest economic in incentive for that, for the people who are living there. And this is the good news from Africa that we have to shout from the rooftop. That's the good news I want to leave you with. That's what an African fish eagle sounds like when he's caught a fish. It's a very celebratory note. And I'd like to thank you very much for coming along today.